Statewide broadcasts of Your Legislators are made possible by the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers on the web at mfu.org. We welcome you to another session of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers answering your questions and discussing important issues affecting the citizens of Minnesota. Join the conversation online on Twitter and Facebook. Now here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to the 41st season of Your Legislators. Pioneer Public Television welcomes all our viewers across Minnesota to this program, an opportunity for you, the viewer, to interact with your legislators, hence the catchy name. We're delighted that you have joined us. This is my 31st season as your host and moderator of this program. My name is Barry Anderson, and my job is mostly to introduce the guests and stay out of the way. This is your program and we invite you to send in your questions and comments that we, so that we can share those with our panel of distinguished guests. I'll be getting to introducing that panel in just a minute, but I wanna begin this evening by recognizing that we are operating under some different circumstances this year. Of course, we're all familiar with them. It's not necessary to review them, but for those of you who have caught our program in previous years, you may be aware that we have come to you from the studios of the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, SPNN, one of Minnesota's fine, fine public access uh, channels, stations. And this year, of course, because of COVID-19, that's not feasible. We're hoping to get back there in the weeks and months ahead uh, as we get on the backside of this crisis. But for now, anyway, we are going to be experiencing this program, you and I and all the uh, folks who will be watching uh, in a method that many of us have become familiar with over the last several months via Zoom, WebEx, or team, Microsoft Teams, or whatever your preferred electronic means of communication. Nonetheless, the program remains the same. It's an opportunity for you to have a conversation with our legislators. We invite you to call in your questions or to send them to us by the various electronic means that will appear on your screen over the course of the program. And our highly efficient, competent staff in Granite Falls will see that I get those questions and we'll share them with the panel. So let's begin this program this evening as we do each week from now until whenever the legislature goes home by introducing our distinguished panel of guests. Um, let's start with someone who has been a, a member of our uh, program, uh, been with us on previous occasions, Senator Mark Johnson. Senator Johnson, we're delighted that you could join us. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, where you're joining us from, because of course, uh, we're not all gathered in St. Paul together. Um, and um, give us some idea of the committees you serve on and your life outside the legislature. The floor is yours, as they say. Well, thank you, Justice Anderson. Appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. These are some pretty unique circumstances, but I've been on the show once before. And on that occasion, uh, you think you ducked out and sent in a guest uh, host on that one. So this is our first time being together. So <laughs> thank you. It's, it's quite an honor being, being on the program. But yeah, I'm State Senator Mark Johnson. I live up in Northwest Minnesota in East Grand Forks. If I open up this shade over here, you'd be looking out over onto the North Dakota side of the river over there. Uh, I live pretty close uh, to that. But when I'm not down the legislature, uh, I am a concrete contractor and a uh, lawyer. So ask me how those two work together. Uh, I'm not sure yet, but uh, a little bit of a little bit of both. Uh, is what we do. And then when I'm down in the legislature, I, I am a deputy majority lead, which is a new position this year. Uh, also chair of a redistricting committee, which will be one of the hot topics, uh, not only this year, but I'm afraid through the summer and into next year, the way the, the data looks like it, it's going to be coming to us. So uh, a number of things going on there. So uh, getting excited to be here. Thank you for the opportunity, Justice. 
delighted to have you with us. Uh, I should also mention that uh, when the court made one of its visits to Greater Minnesota, we were in the uh, Plummer Fergus Falls area and we had a chance to visit there. So, uh, uh, and with many of your uh, legal colleagues uh, from the area. Uh, also joining us, uh, been with us in the past, I believe, uh, Senator Melissa Franzen from Edina. Senator Franzen, we're delighted that you could be with us. Tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Justice. And I have been around in, in real time and real and physical uh, proximity with the, when we used to meet together. So I, I miss that, but certainly thankful for being here tonight. And I am uh, uh, also an attorney by trade. I, I don't know if we're stacking up this panel with attorneys, but I, I have it'll, been- It'll work out okay anyway. It certainly does. We can all um, you know vouch for each other. Uh, since 2012, been elected as the first Democrat in my district, which is Senate District 49. It's the communities of Edina, Bloomington, Eden Prairie, Minnetonka. And I have a small business. I, I also have a, a corporate background. I used to work at Target when I first got elected in government affairs. So uh, I used to be a lobbyist became a, before I became a legislature. So a legislator, I have two little kids, five and four. And I was commenting earlier how uh, difficult the challenges of being a, a legislator, a pseudo stay-at-home mom doing virtual learning and a small business owner. But um, I think all of us are struggling and juggling. So we're all in the same boat together. Well, we're delighted that, uh, that uh, you've joined us uh, and um, uh, the juggling piece, boy, can we all sympathize with that. So also joining us uh, from North Branch, District 32B, Representative uh, New Brindley. Did I pronounce that correctly? That is correct. Tell and and I suppose that's yourself. new. I've been, a, I've been on the program once before as well, but I was Representative New then, so, <laughs> uh, which I suppose is the most interesting thing about me. I, I was... I lost my first husband several years ago and was recently remarried. And uh, I have five children and my husband has five children. So together we have the Brindley Bunch. It's, it's large, happy chaos. Um, I represent the Chisago, most of Chisago County, uh, Taylor's Falls, Brimster, Wyoming, North Branch, and, and lots of uh, communities in between that area. This year I'm excited. I'll be serving on a new committee, the State Government Finance Committee um that we had several committees roll into that committee so i've done some related work but that'll be fun this year i also will be the republican lead on the preventing homelessness committee and then i'm excited to work with senator johnson on redistricting this year. so representative new brindley I, I have to tell you that i was uh um given the, your family background as you've introduced it to us i was having a conversation with some younger lawyers and we were talking about zoom and webex kinds of appearances and made a comment about you look at the screen where everyone is shown and he said it just kind of reminds you of the Brady Bunch. They have no idea what I'm talking about, but I bet you <laughs> so. So, I absolutely know. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Finally, last and certainly not least, uh, joining us from Duluth, Representative Liz Olson. Representative Olson, we're delighted you could be with us. Tell our viewers a little bit about your background and yeah, committees and so forth. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Justice Anderson, and glad to be here with everyone. And yes, I represent District 7B, which is the central and west parts of Duluth, and I am in my starting my third term this year. I serve as the Deputy Majority Leader as well as Speaker Pro Tem, and as the Ways and Means Vice Chair would be kind of the notable things, as well as a few other uh, important committees that are new to me this year that I look forward to getting started on. Uh, my background, I really got involved in the legislature through legislative legislative advocacy. I've mixed both kind of nonprofit and faith work, and uh, did a lot of work around preventing homelessness and hunger issues. And I used to load the buses with advocates that would come to the Capitol and advocate us advocate on their issues. And now it's I'm on the other side, so I'm greeting those folks as they come off the bus and welcoming to the Capitol, making sure that their voices are heard. So. It's a, it's a nice turn and I am really enjoying this perspective as well. And I am doing the juggling the same as everybody here. I have just flew home, greeted my five-year-old after being gone since Monday and then said, but you have to be quiet now. <laughs> Mom has some work to do. So I promised her when this was done, I'd uh, go read a story and cuddle and not make sure she didn't stay up too late. So really glad to be here with everyone and look forward to the discussion. Well, we appreciate that. And when you talk about the different roles that you, uh, you're discussing there, when I joined the Court of Appeals 20 years ago, some of my uh, trial lawyer buddies wanted to know what the change was moving from somebody advocating in front of a judge and now you're a judge. And I said, 
the principal problem is you have to restrain yourself so that you don't come down off the bench and tell them how you think the case should be tried. Nobody's, nobody's interested in your opinion on that. That, is a, that was a, an adjustment process for me. Well, let's, let's begin with you, Representative Olson. We'll go sort of in reverse order here, go back uh, um, uh, along our um, uh, list of guests. And tell us a little bit about what you see as the uh, uh, key issues in this legislative session, things that, that are particular priorities for you, and any other comments you want to make about how you see the next uh, few weeks uh, unfolding. Sure. I mean, we've all, we're on Zoom. We understand what's in front of us. We're still living in a pandemic um, that's overshadowing much of our work in the legislature. We're coming off of our seventh special session. For those of us that served last term less than a month ago, um, between the last special session, what we're walking into right now. And for us, you know, in the DFL House Caucus, we introduced a set of legislation today that was really focused around those urgent priorities that are still left over. The needs of Minnesotans didn't go away with the turn of the calendar page. We still have urgent needs around child care, around issues around housing affordability and homelessness, around education, around making sure our frontline workers are protected, that type of thing. So we still have a lot of unfinished business that really is related to the pandemic we're still living through. Um, that said, we all know it's a budget year and we're gonna have to do a lot of work to come together to compromise with the Senate and work with the governor to pass a, a budget. And for us that really we're going to put forward priorities that, that don't make things worse for the people that are struggling so much right now. We've seen that COVID has really exposed uh, a lot of the ine inequities we know have existed so, for so long in our state. And so now is the time that we, we can really do some things to, to come out of this pandemic in a way that doesn't make things worse for the long haul. So we have our work cut out for us, but I, I'm hopeful that we can do this work well, we can do it together and we can do it in a way that reflects the, Minis the Minnesota priorities and values that the people are asking us to do to make sure we take care of them. Uh, Representative New Brindley, tell us a little bit about the priorities as you see them. Thank you, Justice Anderson. I think as, as Representative Olson talked about, I think the number one priority for all of us, I hope so, is, is really defeating COVID and, and bringing our economy back. Uh, I think we all know that we need to reopen Minnesota safely. Um, and so that I think is, is first and foremost. And I think for, for us, part of that is making sure that the legislature is involved in those decisions we have clearly advocated for and continue advocating to end the governor's emergency powers. But there's some work that needs to happen to, to do that. We've already done a lot of that work. We've codified a lot of the things that need to be codified um, for off ramps for the departments and waivers of rules and things like this. We've done a lot of those things already, uh, but there's still work to be done. Fortunately, I think at this point, the governor recognizes also that we need to get there and that we need to work together. And uh, I, as everyone knows, there are quite a few members of the DFL caucus who have also supported ending those emergency powers. Uh, so we're gonna work towards that because uh, we think that's the, that's the best way to be able to reopen Minnesota safely and make sure that we have a lot of eyes on the issues so that we don't have things falling through the cracks. Uh, and then again, as Representative Olson said, this is a budget year and we're facing a pretty significant deficit uh, for the next biennium. And so we've got to deal with that. We have a significant priority of making sure that we protect Minnesotans against tax increases. Uh, with with a, a budget deficit, it's going to be tough and we need to make tough decisions, but our businesses have been absolutely decimated over the last year. I saw a, a report today that we've lost 10,000 businesses have closed doors during this pandemic the last thing we can do right now is raise taxes on those businesses. So we really need to figure out how to think outside the box, be creative, protect Minnesotans moving forward with this next budget. Senator Franz and your thoughts. Thank you, Justice. Well, I serve on commerce. I'm the lead on commerce. I serve on full finance, which means I'll look at every single bill that has a fiscal impact for our state in a budget cycle, which is pretty important. And I also serve on health reform as well. So. If you had asked me a week ago um, this question, I would have answered very similar to Representative Olson and, and Representative uh, Brindley, New Brindley, in terms of, of the budget being the first priority and getting the economy and defeating 
uh, the pandemic, but after the uh, uh, last 24 hours, my, um, my feelings have changed of what the priorities should be in terms of a state government. And I think we have to instill faith in government, trust in government and lead by example, uh, because we can't afford that to have our democracy crumble um, from the state capital to the US uh, capital as well with the, with the events that happened um, just 24 hours ago and, and the, what they're describing as an insurrection, a coup. So I did not want to be, uh, uh, not miss saying that because I think it's an important part. My little five-year-old um, just last week asked me, mom, um, why are there bad guys? And, and my husband and I were driving and I just said, and we were trying to answer a very um, deep question of a five-year-old. Uh, and we came up with saying, because they don't have good examples, someone to guide them, to help them. And maybe they're desperate and maybe they just don't find another way um, to, to act or, or something of that fact. And I think in this case, um, people are looking for leadership. People are looking for um, an example. And I think every legislator here on this panel and beyond, every elected official should uphold uh, our constitution and our laws. And we need to do everything we do uh, of a daily work, um, like passing a budget, a um, balanced budget for Minnesota, but do it in a way that, that, that respects the rule of, of the, in the process. And I think a lot of people are gonna be watching that. Senator Johnson. Uh, thank you, Justice. Yeah, I, and that's exactly along the same lines uh, that, that I was thinking with, with Senator Franzen here. I think people are really looking for hope right now. We saw this earlier this year uh, when we had the riots, the burnt up Lake, uh, Lake Street in Minneapolis and, and part of St. Paul. You know, people don't feel like their voice is being heard. Well, I think we saw yesterday some of that same reaction. Uh, people call them different mo uh, moves, different movements, but I think there's an underlying similarity between the two. And so we wanna make sure that, that we're doing things that actually represents our communities uh, down in St. Paul. Uh, you know, just today, it, we did a few things in the Minnesota State Senate to really work hand in hand with our DFL counterparts in a number of different ways. Uh, through the resolutions uh, that we did, some of the committee expansions as suggested by Senator Marty, uh, some of those things just to show that bipartisanship and that we have a single goal. So that, that's number one. The other things that we wanna do, of course, are making sure that our government is doing the things government should be doing. You know, roads and bridges, making sure we have a balanced budget, those types of things, going into a budget year that, that's been said, we need to make sure that we're doing the bread and butter. Now, when we, aren't able to meet in, in person and we're doing activities such as Zoom and WebEx and those things, it gets so diff difficult to develop any sort of, you know, new and expansive program that we're pouring, you know, new ideas and energy into when you don't have that personal contact. And I think the leaders have set a, a bar of saying, well, we're going to make sure that we get done what government is designed to do, constitutionally designed to do. And so we're going to be looking at that now, you know, a couple of things have been brought up as well. You know, we can do that without having to be raising taxes. I think representative new Brindley uh, hit it perfectly. We had a structural uh, surplus going into COVID. We know that we can't be turning around and, and putting our heels on the throats of businesses, asking for more money uh, after what, what's they've been through the last nine months. Uh, so we've got to figure out how our services, how our government's going to be delivered uh, and find some efficiencies. I was just talking to a commissioner today who said, you know, Mark, we're, we're looking at things within our, our model right now. You know, look at office space. We can, we can save a lot of money just in reducing the footprint because no longer do we need all those offices. So it doesn't have to be a reduction of services necessarily, but finding those little things that that government can do to be saving money, which you know they owe it to the taxpayers at this moment to figure out ways that they can tighten their belt as well. Well, we have a question from a viewer who um, is concerned about the Center for Rural Policy and Development, uh, which is one of those nonpartisan research agencies that Minnesota has, and it receives some funding from the legislature. And this viewer, I think the viewer is just wondering if, if that's something that is on the forefront of the minds of any of our panelists. But I think more broadly, we should use this opportunity to talk a little bit about how we identify for budget purposes, organizations to support and um, 
maybe what the budgeting process is. Anybody in particular who wants to take that question or have thoughts on that? I can I'll certainly just, give it up. Senator Franzen, let's go to you. Go, sure. go ahead. Well, I sit on finance and this is my, I think, believe my third year on the finance committee and it, it, that's where the budget is is ended up being negotiated and and you know and I've been a lobbyist before so if you're not at the table you're on the menu is kind of something I, I like to say because if we hear from you we're gonna have you on, on top of mind but the problem is not everybody has the resources to hire a lobbyist and not everybody has the ability to go to the capital and now with with the remote capital and remote session it's even harder. So I think uh, from my vantage point, everything should be on the table. You have to make your case. I know organizations that I, I know are near and dear to our hearts are asking for more money, but uh, this is a, we, we went from, uh, we never had a structural surplus in the last, uh, um, this last cycle. We, we know we were gonna go into a deficit. We just right now have a, a small surplus. And then again, we're gonna go back to a deficit in the two, in the next two year biennium. So we're in trouble and we have to make it right. Um, I have a district that's a pretty affluent district, understand that, the, and I'm a business owner myself, so I understand the, the dynamics of, of, of budgeting and how you have to tighten your belt. I grew up with that phrase in my household with my family. Uh, so I think people need to be more active if they can through email, calling, texting. Uh, we are trying to be more accessible, but at the same time, we acknowledge that not everybody has tools of, of internet and broadband. So there's challenges there too. It's not a perfect system, but I would uh, encourage um, anyone to, to really reach out to their legislators and reach out to us um, from all the different uh, parts of the state, especially when we're in committees of relevancy. But I think everything should be looked at um, and everyone should really fight for their, for their budget this year. Uh, maybe it would be useful to talk a little bit about, um, let me pick on you, Representative Olson, um, uh, talk a little bit about, we have a viewer who points to the fact that we have um, a reserve fund. We've also got this um, surplus. Um, doesn't that mean we shouldn't have to make any cuts at all? And uh, maybe talk a little bit about the budgeting process and how that works. Yeah, I will, I will talk about that. And I've just, I think it's, how I came into this office was 2009 when I was working at a homeless shelter, when we were not smart at budgeting, we weren't doing well, our state was in a major downturn. And in order to balance the budget, there were really difficult decisions made, including line item vetoing the healthcare program for the most poor and vulnerable in our state. So we were talking about a situation that looked very similar in terms of a, a deficit and going in. And unfortunately, we saw leaders at the time, um, a Republican governor and legislature that decided that that was the way we would balance the budget and that we would take care of def deficits and we would do that. I absolutely don't want to go back to that. And I think that's where we cannot go back to that. So many of the people that are currently living on the margins, we talked about small business owners, but there are so many folks, especially in the world of people who are already sort of falling through the cracks. And so when we talk about balancing the budget and we talk about, you know, tightening belts and we talk about looking at, you know, what may be um, ways that we can, we can tighten up inefficiencies. But at the end of the day, we have to have a broader conversation around priorities and what it means to budget as a state. And, you know, who are we going to take care of in this budget? And I've heard our speaker say it and many people have said it over the years, a budget is a moral document. And that's what we're talking about here. And thank goodness for Governor Dayton and, you know, and what Governor Walls has done that we have restored uh, a smart budget. We've taken care of, we've put the rainy day fund, we've made sure we have budget reserves. And so it's been really smart so that we hit a day like today where it's raining. We had money, we have ways we can take care of people who need it. That said, we have that there. And I think that's a part of what we need to keep doing is ensuring that our budget remains strong. In the future. Brinkley, what do you think? The budgeting process, the surplus, uh, uh, the rainy day fund, how does all of this fit together? Sure. I think, uh, you know, we are lucky to have a, a very healthy rainy day fund in the state of Minnesota. And I think many of us have felt uh, for, for months now that, boy, if there's ever been a rainy day in Minnesota, uh, this is it. It's, it's been a really difficult several months, both for families and our businesses that have been shut down through no fault of their own. Um, and as, and as it has been pointed out before, normally a business 
can plan for some contingencies. They have insurance for acts of nature or fire or, or things like this. They, they take on risk for economic downturns and things like that. They have no recourse when the government shuts them down. Uh, so that is significant. This is definitely a rainy day. Uh, and, and, and certainly I think we're open to, to using any funds that are readily available. I would just caution that we need to, we need to recognize that those rainy day funds are available just now. Uh, so, so as we work on our budget, when we do a budget, we have something called the tails uh, that, that spends money in years down the road. And so we need to be very careful in spending those rainy day dollars if we do so, that those are paying for things now that are not going to add to a deficit later on. We need to be very cautious in how we do this. As, Repre or as Senator Franson said, she's, she's absolutely right. We need to make sure we are looking at everything and that um, we look for efficiencies. We make sure that whatever programs, whatever population is being served, we look at the best way that those folks are being served. Uh, and, and, I, and I suspect that everyone on the call would agree that our priority is people. We need to make sure that, that our, our top priorities are making sure that we are taking care of, of Minnesota. Senator Johnson, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree that, you know, our first priority is, is taking care of people. Uh, the last year or so, nine months, you know, it's not, it's not the businesses that we're looking at. It's the families, it's the communities uh, that are impacted by that. Uh, you know, right, right here, I've got a number of restaurants that are uh, struggling, but it's not them. It, the, guy, the folks that own it are my neighbors and my friends and those sorts of people. So to start talking about uh, doing things tax-wise, right, raising taxes on businesses, raising taxes on families, those sorts of things, it's pretty insensitive to those people right now who are at, on their knees and in a critical situation. You know, we've got the rainy day fund, uh, which you know, I think Representative Olson uh, may have forgot that Senate Republicans and, and the Senate uh, or in the House, uh, House GOP did a lot of work back in, in 17 and 18 to make sure that we protected that fund and built into it in the last, especially the last two years, made sure that the money was in there so that when a situation like this happens, uh, that we've got that fund ready to go. So we've done a lot of work with that. We've also done a lot of work balancing the budget without raising taxes, whether it's for transportation, we've done uh, for families, we've done middle-class tax cut for families so that they'd have uh, more cash in their pocket, which hopefully they've been saving for an opportunity or, or a situation like we've just faced recently with COVID. Um, you know, so those sorts of things, we're taking care of families, making sure the state is secure in those situations that come up. And, and you know, if we have to dip into the rainy day fund, uh, I, I get it, but uh, we got to make sure that we're protecting our Minnesota families and especially the vulnerable ones. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the governor's emergency powers. Um, I'm not so much interested in the, and I think it's an important issue, but obviously I think there's been a lot of discussion about it publicly about, um, you know, the current situation. Um, should those powers, should he give up those powers or should the legislature act and so forth? But I'm just wondering, have there been any discussions or are there any plans for hearings on the question going forward? Um, you know, I think, I don't want to speak too broadly here, but I think we've typically viewed the governor's emergency powers in the context of a flood or a tornado or a crop failure or some, some sort of immediate event. Um, we've been introduced now uh, to a longer term event, and maybe that causes us to think a little bit about what the structure of those emergency powers should be. Uh, going forward is are there some changes that should be made and I'm just wondering if there are there any conversations about that I'm you know not so much about how this particular emergency has been handled uh, except as it might inform us going forward who wants to take a run at that long complicated and vague question Justice Anderson if, if you don't mind I'll, I'll take a crack at it to begin with uh, but I think you really, you, you asked two different parts, you know, structurally is- There's is, probably three or four questions okay. in there, but anyway, go ahead. I'll, I'll do two of them anyways, and then we'll let, we'll let everybody else jump in. But I think, you know, structurally looking at, at 1231, 
which allows the governor to have those emergency powers. We need to take a look at that. Um, you know, I, I do think, you know, when you read the statute itself, it, it, what it is, is, is it, it's trying to give the governor the ability to do quick actions to uh, allow communities to have the resources they need to fight whatever issue is out there. Uh, you know, and right away in the beginning of the session, or I should say when COVID started, uh, you know, the legislature jumped right in, both the House DFL and the, and the Senate Republicans got together a package, I think it was $550 million, if I have that right, Representative Olson and everybody, um, to help with that. There was also $2.1 billion from the federal government that came in. I mean, the resources are there and it's ready to go. Um, you know, and through the year, those were allocated and spent. And I, I think if communities aren't ready yet, there's really been a failure in execution in getting the resources to those communities. So I think we need to take a look at 1231 and how that is structured um, and maybe give it so that both the House and the Senate have to approve before ongoing emergency powers. The second part is, you know, have we talked about uh, trying to remove those powers again? And, you know, I, I in reality, politically, uh, without the House being willing to take up the vote on that um, and pass that, we're not going to be able to get anywhere uh, on taking those away. However, I think we've got to have a negotiation. We have to have some idea here. If the governor wants to keep them, what is it going to look like? So what we see in the riots last year and what happened yesterday, I think it's people not being able to have a voice in what's going on in government. With the governor having these emergency executive powers, people do not have a voice in government. That's where you see the unrest in rural Minnesota through the businesses, through individuals, people getting riled up because we have no way to speak to the government. We have no way to, to influence when our businesses can open, where we can travel, who we can meet with, if our churches can be open. And that's building up so much frustration that we've got to have a voice in that. We've got to change what's going on right now uh, before people get completely disenfranchised from our government. Representative Olson, you want to take a run at that? Sure. I think just taking it in reverse order there, going backwards from where Senator Johnson left it, that I think we have had a very involved legislature. I mean, the fact we had seven special sessions where we all got to weigh in. I mean, the legislature was incredibly involved in, you know, the COVID relief and whatnot. So the emergency powers are there for a reason, and we still have our ability to ex execute our powers as the legislative branch. And that is what we've been doing. And it's, you know, the pandemic that's really the problem. It's not the emergency powers. It's really that we're in a crisis um, that is killing people. And so I think that's exactly why and we're in new territory. And so to go back to the first part of the question, I do think there is conversation around, you know, this is the first time we've, we've lived through something like this and we're learning. We're learning how to do it better. We're learning what we maybe need to do around 1231 for situations like this. And I think it's not about stripping the governor of his power so that we can open back up. It's about talking about how does our government respond in these situations that are totally unchartered. Um, today, we remote voted for the first time. We didn't see that coming. I mean, we're living through something totally unprecedented and to have our governor be able to respond in the way and still have the legislature weigh in. I think we're, we, we have done a very good job in um, responding and having the governor have those powers where us still having our power as a legislative branch. But that doesn't mean we can't examine going forward um, what we do with that statute. And so I think it's um, good we have what we have now and we can look what that would look like in the future. Representative New Brindley, what do you think? Thank you, Justice Anderson. Yeah, fortunately, you know, uh, the speaker actually has been very open and we really appreciate that, that from her. I think, you know, being back in session, there's a new makeup in the legislature, obviously. The House majority is a little smaller than it used to be. And I think that there's some pressure there. And that pressure is a good thing here. I think it's going to force these conversations to happen in a more meaningful way. Um, and, and I think all of us, including Senator Johnson, I think in the very beginning, we were all on board and we understood the necessity of the emergency order when, when COVID first hit. There were a lot of unknowns. Um, the pandemic was happening quickly, and we didn't know exactly what was going to happen. 
that's not the situation we have today. You know, uh, we talk about emergency powers, but right now the governor is issuing an emergency order at the breakneck speed of about one every 30 days uh, and, and to various degrees of importance. Um, some of them are minor technical issues. Some of them are, are, are more significant, but it's hard to argue that at this point, the governor is acting in an emergency capacity. Now that's not to say there aren't issues to be dealt with, but again, I think those conversations are happening. And I just would like to put a finer point on the, on the importance of the legislature being involved. And this has been our argument from the beginning. When one person is in charge of making these decisions, you know, and I understand he relies on his experts, but you still have one person making the decision and things fall through the cracks. Uh, early on in the pandemic, the governor had a policy of placing COVID positive patients into our long term care facilities and nursing homes. This had a disastrous impact. We all know uh, the death rates um, among our seniors in congregate care facilities. It was, it was absolutely a disaster. And I think if we maybe had some additional eyes on that issue early on, we could have come up with a different solution. Uh, and that's what we think is good. We think that there's a reason that the legislature should be involved here and that's it. So I, I'm, I'm optimistic moving forward. Senator Franzen, your thoughts? Oh boy, this is a very <laughs> uh, big question uh, because I, I would love the emergency powers to go away, quite frankly, but we need a plan. If we're going to take them away, what's the majority party in the Senate, at least, what's the plan to, um, you know, we've codified certain things that we agree on. That's great, but we need a plan so we keep people safe. I was talking to my superintendent for one of my school districts just yesterday uh, they're not back to normal until they have a control in this pandemic when it's 30 cases per 10,000. They're up, upwards of 50 right now. So this is just the number, the data that they're using, plus some art because it's a hard thing to do. We are dealing with something that we don't completely understand. Now we have a new, uh, a new type of, of COVID out there that we don't understand yet. So, and we don't even know the implications of this. So we're playing with something that's really serious. I find it interesting that today in the Senate floor, we spent over an hour, I believe, talking about the mass mandate, where, you know, that is something of contention, uh, the simple act of wearing a mask. I personally wouldn't have mandated it, but I'm not the governor. Um, so I, to some extent, I might agree with some of my Republican members, but we're not mandating the vaccine and we see so many people taking it. So it's just of how we message things. And I think we just need to be uh, you know, t calm down and say, you know, this is not something we all love. I don't like wearing a mask, but I wear it because I want to make sure that the people around me are safe and that my kids can go back to school. Um, and I want people to take the vaccine, but I'm not mandating it because I know this is something people need to, and it's a much more intrusive uh, a mandate, uh, but people are taking it because they know that that's going to keep them safe. So I, I would be comfortable with, with removing emergency powers if we had a plan, if we actually not just talk about working together, but we actually did. Um, so that is my, my two cents on that. And frankly, um, we, we have a lot of work to do because uh, we still uh, know that some of these emergency powers, if they ended tomorrow, evictions is one of them. It would impact the courts because you would be inundated with uh, people um, coming to you to, to solve those issues if we don't have a plan. Um, we talk about healthcare. We know telemedicine has helped so many people. If we take away some of these emergency powers, maybe some of the people who have access to these, um, you know, interim or executive orders that have been just under this um, this time frame, they might go away. So we might need to make sure that we don't let people slip, you know, fall through the cracks. Uh, but there's implications of just removing them tomorrow. But I, I think there's a path. And frankly, I, I do want more involvement in the legislature. And, and I think we should look at them. Um, of how they would work in cases of a pandemic, which they were not written or intended to. But we're learning from that. And I think uh, just pointing fingers at one person, it's not one person. We're looking at, at signs uh, across the country, uh, Dr. Fauci, um, whoever you want to name, people who know more about this epidemiologic, you know, information that we don't, I'm not one of those. So I don't know that information. So I need to rely on experts. Um, and, and also just uh, um, experience really just assume good intent that we're trying to keep people safe, that we're trying to open up the economy. Uh, I, I work with business owners all the time in my district, um, pleading for us to open and I'm trying to do my best to represent them. And, and I think we'll get there, but it's gonna take more than just um, talking about working together. It actually needs to happen. And, and I, you, you had 
one second there, you said, um, I just want to go back to the, the plan issue. And I think people would, would love to have a voice in that plan. And the attempts to negotiate with the governor on how things are going to be looking, you know, what the plan is and, and that, uh, it hasn't gone very far. And I know the governor has really um, not moved on that. So we can't have a plan. We can't have negotiations on that because the governor doesn't want to. And then you, you continue to talk about experts and science and different things like that. We also have community experts. We have people within our communities who are experts at how things are running within our communities. And they no longer have a voice in being able to do that. You know, our superintendents over here, uh, there's several of them that have been very upset because the same plan that they put forth this spring to open up was the same plan that they opened up with this fall but they weren't able to this spring, but they, it was good enough later this fall. And, and so just these different things where they no longer have input, that's the frustration that we're having. We can't plan if they're not willing to work with us. So that's some place that we need to open up. We are there in session, we're ready to talk, we're ready to put a plan together. You know, if, if the administration would be willing to do that, uh, we would be happy to. Can I just respond to that? Because I think we can work ahead, yeah. as a legislative body. We have a House and the Senate. We can bring something together to the governor that we agree on. Uh, so that we can't just blame the governor for not, not signing something. We haven't given him something to sign. Sound, sounds like we can work together on something then. Let's do that. So we've got a viewer from Cottage Grove who wants to, um, this viewer is uh, uh, identifies uh, herself as a disabled uh, uh, she's a disabled veteran uh, who moved back to Minnesota, and um, she's um, wondering whether or not uh, the legislature will seek to expand benefits for uh, veterans in her situation. She points to Texas and California states that uh, she thinks do a little better job in terms of uh, providing those benefits. Veterans, uh, veterans issues, veterans benefits questions have come up periodically on this program. Um, I'm not surprised to see them surface here. Who wants to take a run at that question? Anybody? Representative New Brindley, let's pick on you. What are you, veteran service questions? What are you, uh, veteran service uh, benefits and issues? With, what, uh, what's your view on that? Sure, well, first of all, I would, I would thank the viewer for her service. Um, and second of all, fortunately, veterans issues are, are uh, very bipartisan, I think. You know, when it comes to our veterans, Republicans and Democrats all agree we need to take care of those who have served our country and sacrificed. Uh, so, so certainly, I think um, we we have we've done a reasonably good job, but we are always happy to look at additional ways to help and serve our veterans. And, and again, particularly as the viewer indicated, she's a disabled veteran. She, uh, she served our country and the least we can do is help care for her needs now. Uh, this, is, this is one of our most basic responsibilities. One question, one response, I, you know, I think it's important uh, is that um, if there are specific issues of concern uh, to contact your veteran service officer in the county in which you reside, uh, <clears throat> I didn't really understand the the uh, how what a great grasp of information that these individuals have. They um, they really do uh, they really do provide a useful service, and that's a good place to start. And then let your legislator know if there are specific changes that should be made in the stat in various statutes. So um, I think it's a great question, and hopefully uh, hopefully she will uh, uh, forward some suggestions that the legislature can consider. Anything else on the veteran service issue? That we'll move to another question. Um, uh, what do we see as priorities in the pre-K dash um, high school education area of legislation? Of course, this is a budget year, but also education policy questions also pop up. Uh, Representative Olson, let's start with you. Um, what, what might happen on the um, the K? What I would have called K K to twelve education. Now it's pre-K to twelve. Yeah, I mean, obviously, first, we need to get the pandemic under control so that our schools can, we can get our kids back in the classroom. Um, but because it's a budget year, I mean, that is one of the most, that's a, a place where we can have an impact with how we fund our schools, and it takes investment. So 
um, it, if we're going to do the veteran services, if we're going to do education, then we have to get serious about what it's going to take. I, you know, we have underfunded our schools for a long time and we have an opportunity. You know, these are the times when we should be investing. I think all of us have seen even more clearly what it takes right now and what our schools have done. It's been a Herculean effort. We see them providing childcare, distance learning, and then the next day they're providing in classroom our paraprofessionals that are at the front lines of, of delivering food to families right now. So I think we're seeing that full scope of our schools and what they do for our communities and all the ways that we need to take care of our schools from our paraprofessionals to the mental health folks to making sure our special ed kids have full services. You know, I think we have in, in to be quite frank, that takes investment. Um, we can't just write policy that's gonna do all of these things. It takes investment and it takes having the political courage to say, you know, these are the things that make us Minnesota, Minnesotans to care about our schools. So it, it does take funding. It takes per pupil funding. It takes making sure that we fund mental health folks and make sure that we fund and make sure we protect our frontline paraprofessionals and support staff right now that we see as so valuable. And we've done that as a House DFL caucus and the Senate DFL in the last go round. You know, we put forward, uh, you know, a revenue package that went straight into funding our education system from pre-K all the way up to um, up to graduating seniors and beyond. So, um, you know, this is something that I think we really need to come together around and the time is now, even when it's a tough time and a tough budget in front of us. Representative uh, New Brindley, what your thoughts on K-12, pre-K-12 education? Thank you, I, I, I really appreciate this. And, you know, th the first thing I would say is, We've done a good job of funding education. Certainly every, every uh, session that I have been in the legislature, we have increased the education budget by 2% every year. Uh, we've made significant investments. And I think that there's a misperception out there. Uh, you know, and, and I'll pick on Senator Franson's district just a little bit because people often think that Regina is, is sort of the gold standard for funding of, of education in Minnesota, but the reality is Minneapolis students get, have significantly higher per pupil funding than those in Edina even. Um, so, so funding is sometimes put out there as a bit of a red herring, but I would say there's a really critical issue. I was able to serve on the Select Committee for Racial Injustice over the summer, and there were some things that were really eye-opening. First of all, I, I believe that K-12 education is the civil rights issue of our time. Um, and you know, unfortunately, sadly, we, we did not hold committee hearings on, on K-12 education, but this is a critical issue, and particularly the pandemic is, is increasing the divide between the haves and the have-nots in our state. And we're going to have a real issue to deal with when this pandemic is over and kids have, have uh, been left behind in this pandemic. Just... And just to touch again on the racial inequities, you know, there were quite a few folks who, who testified on, in that committee, not specifically on education, but they talked about the issue. This last in first out policy has been disastrous for teachers of color. Uh, they, they are often recently hired teachers and therefore they're the first let go when layoffs are happening. Uh, the, there was a teacher of the year, actually, a young woman, a person of color, teacher of the year twice laid off from her job uh, simply because she was the last one hired. So she was the first one to go, even though she was recognized for the quality of her teaching. Um, we, need to, we need to really examine policies like this to make sure that we have the best teachers in the classroom and that uh, we are serving our kids the best way we can. Senator Franz, and your thoughts? My thoughts since I got picked on with Edina, but um, I, I think the issue of education, early education is, is an issue that impacts the entire state and, and something I've worked on for many years about uh, prioritizing funding for quality early ed across the state. Uh, but we compete with funding. We don't have funding for everything. Uh, but I do wanna say um, in line of the question on the veterans and, and disability services, uh, we know that this pandemic, um, and I'm talking again to my, my school districts, um, they're already preparing for a bigger class of people that are going to need students that are going to need services, not just for disability, but for potential risk uh, because of, of various factors. So not the normal time frame where they kind of project a 10%. It's going to be twice as much, if not larger. So, so we're going to need more resources, more teachers to help 
with students that are going to need more um, help to, to get through uh, these. And then they might stabilize. But the point is um, that, that those type of services are, are not um, dependent on zip code. We have disabilities across our state and we have students that need those resources. And many of, of our constituents who have disabilities usually are left behind because, uh, again, they don't have the access that, that a lot of others have to, to policymakers like ourselves. But we can't um, ignore the fact that people are struggling and that we have more need than we ever had before. And it's not just about resources, it's about innovation and finding ways to, to be able to um, leverage those um, innovations that we've already uh, are exercising with this pandemic. But we know that that's, there's gonna be a huge need. And, and you know, um, for veterans, I have worked on issues on veterans and they have been when constituents come to me and because I do not serve in those committees and you'd be surprised um, how much you learn and how much you're able to help veterans when they come, um, when they're able to to have advocates like us at the Capitol to help them with issues. So um, don't despair. Please reach out to your legislator, and we'll certainly look to help uh, our, our good veterans for our state. Senator Johnson, K-12, pre-K-12 education. Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank uh, the educators who are out there and, and listening to the show today. You know, I those of us who have had kids at home now over this last year have really um, saw firsthand the value of our educators in the classroom. And we thank you very much for that. And as Representative New Brindley said, you know, we have really been investing in our schools, in our teachers over the last four years since I've been in. I was elected in 2016. And each year we've, we've put in significant resources into our education system to the point where K-12 education takes up about 42 to 43% of our state budget. Uh, if you add in higher education, that's nearly 50% of our state budget goes into uh, education because it is one of our most valuable assets. And one of the jewels of Minnesota is our education system. And now when you look at uh, the scores and the issues that are arising in the schools, we've got to be able to figure uh, new ways to use that money. We have to look at the ROI uh, of the dollars that we're putting in. And I'm really excited about uh, Senator Roger Chamberlain taking over the K-12 committee in the Senate. He's somebody that's willing to think outside the box and try to get more uh, out of our students, out of our schools, in a way that's creative, in a way that matches the 21st century uh, economy and society. And, and there are so many things that we've got to be looking at. It can't be the same old system that it has been for years and years and years. We all recognize uh, the changes that have happened. And I think that there's a, really an opportunity now to make those changes for our kids because we need to adjust them to this new economy and this new society. So. I think there's a lot of opportunities and I'm excited about the things that we can do now uh, in this next year or two. As long as we're touching on, higher, on uh, K-12 education, we've only got a couple minutes left, but let's talk about higher education. Um, maybe one or two issues that you think are going to be really critical as we move forward throughout this year. Representative Olson, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think we have seen um, that's such an important part of the continuum and about what we need to do with our around our entire economy and our trade schools and our pipelines. So I think, you know, we're going to be seeing a lot around the education world from kind of an entire vantage point and representing a district that has kind of a plethora and with our community colleges and what we need to be doing around workforce right now, I think will be really important. Um, especially as we come out of a pandemic to make sure that we are thinking about the entire workforce and the role that our um, community colleges and whatnot play in that I think is going to be really important. Obviously, the funding thing will be coming up as we, you know, put together the higher ed budget, which will be difficult thinking about tuition freezes and how college students are doing in this economy themselves as well. Representative New Brindley, we've got about a minute or so, a minute and a half. Quickly, higher ed. Yeah. Thank you. I, you know, um, I, uh, Representative Olson alluded to it as well. I think that there is a significant need, and and actually, I think it's been very bipartisan. The the goal of uh, more technical education, uh, moving kids into the trades. We we I think we are coming to a place where we recognize that a four year college education is not the right path for everyone. 
for those kids who that is the right path for, we need to make sure that we continue to have that option and we move kids in that direction. But there are lots of kids for whom that's not the right, right option. And uh, we need to continue to, to focus on making sure that those kids also have good opportunity with technical education, the trades, et cetera. Senator Franzen. Yeah, I agree on the trades and on apprenticeship is another piece that I think should have more, um, more um, significance in, in our education, higher education, where you, you connect your, your employers to uh, the educational institutions, whether it's technical college or a four-year college. But I agree that there's a lot of room for, for people to gain um, a lot of skills and, and go get a really good job in the trades. Senator Johnson, you got about 15 seconds. It's yours. Well, Justice, it's all been said, but not everybody's said it yet. But I agree a lot with, with what's been said. We need to be looking at a mix of education. I want to thank our, our panel this evening, uh, our uh, maiden voyage here as we begin a new uh, season of your legislators. We had to do something completely different because of circumstances that are affecting everyone. This is a minor problem compared to the major problems that some people are dealing with as a result of uh, our, uh, our pandemic experience, but I'm very grateful that uh, you all joined me for this adventure, and I'm grateful for our viewers who sent in all those wonderful questions. I want to remind them they can send in their questions uh, during the week preceding our next program. We will be back here uh, again a week from Thursday night, and every Thursday night that follows until the legislature goes home. Again, thanks to the panel, thanks you to the viewers, and good night. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org slash your legislators. Find out more about the history of the program, who has been a guest, and watch past episodes and discussions by topic. To continue the conversation, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research, leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers on the web at mfu.org.